Welcome to Scary Stories. We've got around two hours of Dogman for you this time. Don't worry, it's a collection of short stories, so you don't have to binge it all at once if you don't want to. Of course, we don't mind if you do. Besides a collection of stories, I'm going to show you the cool stuff I just got sent by the Hodag fan club. Those of you who come from Rhinelander, Wisconsin know that the Hodag is the other famous Wisconsin cryptid besides the Dogman, and it seems I now have an autographed picture of him suitable for framing. But you don't get any of the fun stuff until first we do some scary stuff. In this case, that means our all-new, never-before-heard, allegedly true story, Dogman Invades Polar Bear Turf Dear Scary Stories NYC, I've got a story about the Dogman far up north, way farther north than I ever would have guessed he lived. It was up at the very most distant part of mainland Canada, and the year was 1992. Have you ever thought you were in love to the point where you followed this person to the literal ends of the world? If so, was it worth it? It wasn't for me. When I was just out of college, I was working a day job that my live-in girlfriend got for me, and I was doing anything she wanted me to do. I had never even had a serious girlfriend before, and then suddenly, there was this young lady I'll call Darla, and she took over bossing me around where my mother had left off. I was thrilled, at the time, to have an honest-to-God sex partner who was willing to be seen with me, even in public, as this was a huge step up the social ladder for a loser like me. It took me a few years to figure out that I would be happier doing something else, but this was the early period where I was happy with anything she did and agreed with everything she said. And when she said we were going to visit some kind of nature preserve at the northernmost point of Canada to try to get to see the largest to try to get to see the largest and most dangerous land predator known to man. I didn't even think it through before I agreed to the trip. So the plan was to hike with a guide and some other people through the Tuk Tut Nugate National Park in order to get to see polar bears from a distance. Imagine how in love I must have thought I was to agree to that. I am not exactly Bungalow Bill. So we went north past the ends of civilization, all because my girlfriend thought polar bears were pretty. The package we signed up for was supposed to be a group of 12 people with two guides. When we got there, though, we found out that we were the only two tourists who had shown up, and we only had one guide. He was this really old native fellow who was always drinking and enjoyed taking sudden catnaps without telling us what was going on. This guy would wrap himself up in this thing he had, I don't know what it was called, and then he would drop to the ground, even in places where it was snowy, and he would curl into a fetal position and have a 20-minute nap. Darla and I would find ways to keep warm till the old man regained consciousness. One time when he woke up, he started screaming, Where am I? When we walked over to remind him where he was, he started looking at us and shouting, who the devil are you? He seemed to have completely forgotten the last 35 years of his life, and I was terrified that we'd never get back to civilization. Then, the old coot pointed at us and laughed coldly. He was only pranking. You know, as annoying as that guy was, I had a similar sense of humor to him in those days, and he'd always succeed in getting me and Darla to laugh. Well, you know, after we'd recovered from our heart attack. Speaking of heart attacks, it's time for me to tell you about the scariest scene I ever got too close to. This is the part you came to hear about. So get your popcorn ready and dim the lights because this is the best true story about my life that I've got to tell. So we were hiking through an area that was green, not snow covered. It was still cold as hell as far as I'm concerned and our cheeks were bright red from the combination of freezing wind and bright sunlight. I suddenly saw a young polar bear bounding out of a green area covered with foliage in the distance. As much as their fur hides them in icy regions, 
It makes them stand out that much more when they travel through a green area. In fact, I didn't even know polar bears ever did travel through green areas. So I pointed, and we all stopped and stared. We had been warned that polar bears can grow six feet tall at the shoulder and become 12 feet tall when they stand up on their hind legs. This one was not that size. It would have been maybe six or seven feet tall if standing by Peely, and that would be the maximum. So I suppose it was too old to be a cub, but too young to be a full adult, a teenage polar bear. I couldn't see what it was chasing, but it seemed to be in a rush for some reason. In the next instant, crashing out of the bushes from behind the light-furred bear was something that none of the three of us ever expected to see. It turned out that bear was not chasing something. It was being chased by something. That something was a large, dark animal, too skinny to be a bear and too tall to be a human being, and it was chasing the young bear out of that greenery. We weren't looking at another bear. We were looking at something else entirely. Grabbing binoculars out of our backpacks, we all staked out locations where we could get a better angle on the action taking place in the distance. There was this big gray thing that none of us could identify. I asked our guide repeatedly what that was, and his face just got redder and redder. Finally, he had to admit that it did not look like anything he'd ever seen before. In fact, the only thing he could even compare it to were some legendary local monsters, which he said the names of in his native language. Unfortunately, I do not remember those names he listed at that time. We watched that upright walking creature jump the bear, we saw it hold that bear tight. Then, we watched as the darker colored creature tore at that bear with his back legs. This was clearly not play fighting as the bear let out such a terrible sound. You knew he was being hurt by the other one. Darla ran toward the bear as though she were going to somehow be able to help him. I ran after her and so did our guide. We told Darla to stop. We urged her to come back. Soon, she was running at full tilt toward the polar bear, and I was running full tilt after her. The battle between the polar bear and that other thing continued, and the sounds both creatures made were almost as painful to our ears as they must have been for the ones crying out like that. I was horrified and what might happen to Darla if she got too close to those out-of-control monsters, each of them larger and heavier than I was. It was a terrible moment, it really was. So Darla only had to get past one more patch of trees, then she was going to be in the home stretch with nothing else between her and the fighting animals. I never ran so hard before. I was out of strength, and yet I kept on running. But before Darla could make it into that end run toward her dubious goal, an immense, hairy beast, darkly colored and upright, just like the beast attacking that young polar bear, walked out of the trees, staring forward at the fighting and staring away from my girlfriend. She was unable to avoid running smack into the back of that hairy cryptid. This one was tall enough that she sort of ran face first into its butt, practically. Then, when it turned around to stare at Darla lying stunned on the dirt, the creature revealed to us that it was, in fact, a female. It was also unmistakably a canine of some sort. Maybe it was a wolf or something, but it was standing like a human being. Almost. I mean, Darla ran into it from behind at her top speed and she just bounced off it. Or I should say, bounced off her. The huge female upright canine started barking and growling at Darla, bending over and getting up in her face about it. I collapsed to my knees in exhaustion, gasping for air and unable to do anything but watch from a distance. That dog woman looked as though she were about to eat my girlfriend's face off and I was so wiped out, the only thing I was going to be able to do about it was I was going to be able to watch it happen. 
But then something occurred which both made the situation far worse and saved Darla's life at the same time. The mama polar bear wandered onto the scene and she roared. She stood on her back legs as she shouted and the entire area shook. This beast was even larger than the canine mother and it was clear the balance of power had shifted. The dog woman forgot all about Darla and turned, walking tall, toward the other mother, posturing and bellowing. If these two were going to have a fight, it was going to be a vicious and brutal one. Our guide, drunk as he was, gathered the two of us up and led us slowly away from the fighting behind us. It seemed that most of what was left was a display of bravado by the two moms as the younger ones ran to their mothers and the fighting appeared to be winding down. We didn't stay to watch though. We were beat up, exhausted, and oddly starving hungry at the same time. We stayed up there for another few days but spent more time in our hotel room eating room service than anything else. We sort of had our fill of the freezing cold and the viciously savage animals. It was a nightmare as far as I'm concerned, and I'll never date another nature-loving woman, especially not if she brings me to North Canada on the day when... Dogman invades polar bear turf. Hey, check this out. We did an episode a while back about Wisconsin's other famous cryptid, the horrible and hideous Hodag. I first heard of the Hodag when it was mentioned by the Cramps in their song from the movie Return of the Living Dead. They introduced me to most of the Midwest monsters as they grew up in Cleveland. I never knew what a Hodag actually was before, but now I've joined his fan club. So what did I get? Let's see. Here's a letter welcoming me to the official Hodag fan club. Oh look, I get the Hodag business card. That's good. Now I can hire him when I need a monster. Who is this a sticker? I wonder what I could stick that on. I've been out of school for 77 years by now. Check this out, there's more. A magazine. The Hodag himself writes this editorial, which is entitled Happy Summer Friends. Ah, there's the Hodag eating ice cream because it's summer. Apparently he can stand up like Godzilla when he eats ice cream. Down here are some fan photos of the Hodag including a drawing and whatever that green thing is. Here's the Hodag with flowers in his hair, teaching us how to plant seeds. He's not a very scary monster, is he? Sort of a peacenik. Uh-oh, Hodag jokes. Ready? What kind of a tree can the Hodag fit in his hand? A palm tree. Wait, so the Hodag has hands and palms? Hmm, I don't think these are very Hodag-specific jokes here. Well, I think the best and most incredible thing in this envelope is this romantic picture of the Hodag. See, he's all dressed up, wearing a bow tie, and he's giving you his sexiest monster gaze. Then underneath, he autographs it, Love the Hodag, and he leaves a very tiny paw print. You know what they say about tiny hands, but the ladies love the Hodag anyway. If you need a sexy, romantic, autographed Hodag picture in your life as much as I did, then just send an email to hodagfanclub.com and you can become a member for free just like your old pal Bigfoot. And now for something completely scary. Dogman and the Thunderbird. Dear Scary Stories NYC. I've got a Pennsylvania Dogman story for you, but it happened in Natstown, which is just like 10 or 15 miles north of Maryland. For that and some other reasons that I'll hopefully remember to get to later, this could also sort of be said to be a Maryland cryptid account as well. So I'm going to dive right into the action of the story. I was driving down Spring Road, which is a tiny, thin little strip of tar that hardly anyone uses who doesn't live around here or need to deliver something to someone who does live over here. It's a one-way, and you aren't supposed to drive above 35 on it. And nobody ever has, I don't think except for me, on the afternoon I'm about to describe to you. While driving down Spring Road, I saw a really big, hairy, 
naked man run out of a path in the woods to my left, then turn to his left, almost running into the front end of my car in the process. I screeched to a stop and pulled off the road a bit to let whatever it was finish whatever it was doing. As the big guy ran in front of me, I could see that his hairy butt was covered by a long, hairy tail. He had ears like a wolf, straight up on top of his head, and although he appeared in most ways to be more wolf than man, he ran upright, on his hind legs, with all the grace of the most gifted athletes in all history and prehistory combined. Was that a man who looked like a dog? Or was that a dog who looked like a man? He and the road were soon darkened by a shadow from overhead, and it looked as though a person were flying a glider above me somewhere. I leaned out the window to watch the big hairy guy run away, squinting up into the bright cloudless sky. I could swear I saw the wings of that fixed-wing aircraft flap, which, if not an optical illusion, would mean that either the glider was falling apart in mid-air, or else that it was a real bird, but a bird as large as the legendary Thunderbird. I watched from the driver's seat, with my jaw hanging open, as that bird thing flapped down toward the road, barely clearing the width between the trees on either side of the road. Flying lower, it grabbed the dogman, one shoulder in each massive, taloned claw. You can't imagine the terrible noises emitted by those two beasts, as each had a very different agenda in mind for that afternoon. I can't imagine that the dogman had ever been picked up that way before, as though he were a rag doll. On the other hand, I can't imagine that huge, flapping behemoth of a bird had ever even tried to lift something as big and heavy as the dogman either. There was a lot of kicking and screaming on both ends. The dogman was flailing about and occasionally would score a painful looking clawed swipe at that bird as they rose. The space between the trees narrowed as the raptor flapped furiously and not only leaves were flying but branches as well. Between the flying detritus and the fact that they were flying too high for me to see in any way but the vaguest of silhouettes, it appeared the show was over, and that I should get back on the road and drive home. Now I don't know what came over me, because I am the kind most known for procrastination, but I guess I realized I couldn't rewind this later and rewatch it. Either I followed that weird naked man with the wolf head and his giant bird friend, or I never for the rest of my life would ever find out what the heck that was all about. Maybe it's just the last two or three years that I've spent mostly watching the first two acts of movies on 2B TV, then never getting around to watching the ending, but suddenly I remembered what it felt like to be alive in that moment, the way life used to be, before we decided it had a pause button. So before I knew it, I had made a U-turn, and I was driving after the two of them, the wrong way, on a narrow one-way lane, and well over the speed limit as well. Don't try this at home, kids. Eventually, if you break the law and risk your life long enough going the wrong way on that skinny road, you come to a large field on your right. When I reached that point, I saw the dogman being dropped to the ground from about the level of the treetops. Again, I'm not sure what possessed me other than the vague memory of what life was like in the before times, when curiosity was still encouraged and not yet a punishable offense, but I got out of my car and I ran out into that field. I wanted to see what that dogman looked like up close. Do you remember that feeling of just wanting to know? Do you remember that feeling of running all out through a field as though you were a living, breathing creature? No? Well, I had forgotten them too but they all came back in that intensely exciting moment. I could sort of see where the dogman's body had fallen, but I could not see well enough to tell if he was still breathing or not. Something, some vestigial instinct, told me to look up at the sun. I've never had that urge before, but I did then, and when I squinted upward, 
I saw just enough to get the vibe that the bird was swooping down at me. That bird was smart enough to hide its attack by instinctively moving itself to the exact place where its intended victim would see the sun. I, I had severely underestimated this giant hunting bird. I had thought it dropped the dogman because the fight was over and that it was flying away to fight another day. I thought the gesture of dropping him meant that the Thunderbird was finished with the dogman. Suddenly, face down and eating dirt in that field, I realized that the bird had dropped the dogman by accident. Then, since I had presented myself as a smaller and less feral snack, the bird had opted toward hunting me instead. Two more times the big raptor flew down toward the ground at me, and in both cases, I was able to scuttle and squirm out of the way just in time. When the bird was slowing itself down, the closer it drew to the ground, the fiercer and harder it needed to flap its wings. There was such force being exerted down onto me that I couldn't possibly stand, even if I had wanted to. I quickly noticed the amount of time it took the bird to rise up high enough to swoop down again, and the next time the bird flew up in the air, I started crawling then running toward my car, parked under the trees on the opposite side of the road. The bird did initially pursue, but decided not to swoop down because I was already too close to the tree line. It would have crashed into that patch of woods, and it would not have been a pretty sight. I climbed inside the car, locked all the doors, and closed my eyes. Then, I just breathed the air and let my heart beat as fast as it wanted to, knowing I was safe in that car. The dogman, however, was not. A loud, painful howling erupted from the field across the street. I looked and saw the dogman quite alive and kicking in a literal fashion. The Thunderbird had him once again, and I watched as they barely cleared the top of the tree line. Rising further and further upward into the sky, I saw them fly off toward the mountains in the south. So I've been reading up and listening to anything I can find about Maryland and Pennsylvania dogmen, or flying cryptid legends or recent reports too. I found one on your channel that I've later read and heard more about in other places on the internet. That is the legend of the Snallygaster and its brother legend of the Dueo. Now these are both Maryland legends, while Nat's town is in PA. As I mentioned earlier though, it's only 15 miles north of Maryland, and I doubt that either the dogman or that big bird know what the difference is between one state or another. Now the Dueo in the famous Maryland legend sounds as though he is a dogman, or at least an upright walking canine. And according to myth, going back generations in the region, the chief enemy of the Dueo, or the Maryland Dogman, is a flying serpent called a Snallygaster. Now, I did not see a flying serpent. It was not a dragon. It was not a pterodactyl. It was not a pterosaur. It did not have bat wings or leathery wings. It had feathery wings, and it looked something like a very large hawk with a somewhat longer beak. Its eyes had that angry raptor look to them, and the beak was a pale yellow, as were the claws. The rest was a mix of dark and light brownish shades. It would have been beautiful to see if it were not large enough to carry away a creature heavier than me. So I have been watching the skies since then, and I wear welder's goggles when I go out for nature walks or drives. They look weird, but they're tinted in such a way that you can look up at the sun without hurting your eyes. Now that I know that bird hides in the brightness of the sun, even when I don't have the welder's goggles on, I want to know where that sun is in the sky relative to me. The people who have known me the longest say that I've become an eccentric. That may be so, but at least I'm still among the living. Most of them would also be walking around in welder's goggles if they had been there on that bright afternoon when I witnessed the battle between Dogman and the Thunderbird.
Don't go anywhere, we've got another all new Dogman story right now. Old VHS party interrupted by the Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC. Hey, I had that Dogman thing happen to me one time. It wasn't just me, it was also my buddy Alcohol Bud, who sadly was lost in an overseas conflict a few years after this story. Settle in, it didn't really take that long to happen, but it takes a minute to tell. So my grandfather died, and when they read the will, it turned out that I had inherited Grandpa's secret cabin. He never told any of us about this place, as I guess he enjoyed the solitude when he was there. It was well kept and the electricity was on, so either Grandpa or someone else had to have been there fairly recently. I didn't know that and I was scared to open it up when I first got there. I half expected to find rats inside eating Grandpa's Playboy and Hustler collections. Inside, it was a bit dusty, but not too bad. Bud found a pile of three large cardboard boxes in one of the closets, and the boxes were filled with old VHS video cassettes. Most of them looked like they were bought from stores back in the old days, and they still had their original covers, even with parts of the original plastic wrapping on some of them. There were others that had been recorded off television, each labeled neatly with a black ink pen in Grandpa's handwriting. It was quite a treasure trove for fans of 20th century media like me and Bud. Good condition video cassettes from cool companies like Rhino and something weird. A month or more's worth of grainy, wobbly, 640x480, blurry VHS goodness. We looked around for a working VHS machine and failed in that endeavor, which must be why the tapes were in the closet in the first place. Bud said he had a VHS machine at his place that was hooked up and working and suggested we bring the tapes to his house. I had a better idea. We knew two film school girls that we were trying to get with for some time. I thought we should invite them out to the cabin for a VHS night and see if we had any chemistry with them. So we ended up bringing Bud's VHS player and an old TV out to my grandpa's cabin two film school girls along for the ride. This next part is the part where the werewolf or dogman finally makes his entrance. To so get ready. Okay, the girls wanted to watch these tapes that had like Maya Darren experimental films or the monkey's feature film head. Finally, Bud put on something scary. It was an old Mexican werewolf movie and we started trying to get closer to the girls. You know, to act protective if they got scared at the movie and all that stuff. All of a sudden, Bud's girl started screaming, and the rest of us hit the ceiling. I mean, that girl was really loud. She hurt my ear, and I wondered if Bud had goosed her or something like that. But it turned out it had nothing to do with Bud at all. She was pointing out the window where there was what looked to all the world like a dude in an expensive werewolf mask or makeup. I mean, it was such a nicely done job that I'd even go so far as to say that it looked pretty real. So the guy outside the window sees that we're all staring at him, and so he goes away, right? Now the film school girl with me, I don't remember her name, she starts yelling at me about how that was one of my friends in a costume. She said I had put someone up to peek in in the window just to scare the girls. Now that really got me annoyed. Bud and I finally got these two alone, and she was accusing me of inviting a third guy along? Why would I do that? Trust me, I am not into sharing. That's not my thing. So I just laid it on the line. I was like, hey, film school girls, listen up. Neither of us would have ever invited along some third guy. So that basically means either we just saw the face of a nut job walking through the woods wearing a really expensive werewolf costume, or we just saw a real werewolf. In either case, it wasn't my fault, and in either case, I didn't want to be yelled at about it. None of us had the nerve to go outside and look, so when it was quiet for a long while, we all got bored and figured the guy left. We put the movie back on, and it wasn't that long after, until there was a tapping at the window. The creature was back, and this time he was deliberately drawing attention to himself. It was apparent that he was a male, and he made certain we could see that. 
Although he seemed neither man nor wolf, he seemed most interested in drawing the attention of our dates. It seemed interesting to me that the women were no longer screaming at the sight of the cryptid outside, but rather seemed sort of interested and fascinated by his presence instead. It seemed odd to me how they suddenly had nothing to say, since they hadn't stopped pronouncing their opinions on everything since we met up with them earlier in the day. Suddenly both were standing, their eyes looking wide open like a baby deer, completely dilated and open, eagerly receiving any light rays which had bounced off that monster outside the window. I won't say that all fear had left them, but it now seemed to be coupled with some other kind of energy that made them more than willing to face that fear. I think they were enraptured by the dogman. I think if that dog-headed man had asked them to dance, they would have been doing an Irish jig already. We were young men, I mean relatively speaking, and we did have at least a little bit of pride left. The more we saw those film school chicks staring gaga at the dogman mask guy outside, the less he seemed scary and the more he seemed like a jerk who was gonna get himself a punch in the nose. So when one of the girls started to sort of moan a little, or I guess you'd call it more of a whimper, both Bud and I stormed out of that cabin into the dark night, intending to give Cosplay Boy a little piece of our minds. Only when we got out there, we could see pretty clearly, lit by the internal light flooding out of that cabin, that this was not some loser in a costume. It was an actual, upright standing canine, with these front paws that had thumbs, or at least something that looked an awful lot like thumbs. And he was staring inside at those film school girls who just stared right back. Bud and I gave each other a look like I had not considered that it might be a real werewolf. And we both sort of politely, quietly, let ourselves back inside and locked that door behind us. The dogman had never even turned to look at us. He was only interested in the girls. We looked at them, still staring out the window, and we looked out the window to see the canine staring back in at them. Bud pulled the shade down, blocking view of the window. The girls reacted as though someone had thrown cold water on them. Bud suggested we stop watching werewolf movies and put on something early and Canadian by David Cronenberg. I guess Dogman doesn't like Cronenberg films because he left us alone for the rest of the night. And even more weirdly, the girls just moved forward, acting sort of like nothing had ever happened. When we drove them home in the morning, the conversation was entirely about the movies we had watched, and nothing about the Dogman at all. Since we never dated or hung out with those girls again, we never really found out their side of the story. Did they remember the same things happening that we remember? Usually it's the guy who plays the strong and silent card, but those girls never really let us know what their side of the story was, and what their experience of the Dogman was either. I mean, we dropped that subject because we were still hoping to get something romantic to happen, so maybe it was the same thing for the girls. I still to this day wonder if there was some kind of mental communication between them and the dogman outside that window. After all, those girls sure did look transfixed and hypnotized on the night when we headed out to that cabin for that old VHS party interrupted by the dogman. The Sasquatch likes to roar and then the dogman likes to bark. And we would like to thank our EP Super Spark. Super Spark joined our channel membership at a high enough level to access plenty of our cool perks. More from Henry Lee Dogman at the end of the show, but now. Ambushed by Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC. When I was still living with my parents, I nearly got taken down by an actual dogman. It was part of the reason I bailed on my hometown, and part of the reason I'm putting myself through college now in a different state. I keep coming up with excuses to avoid going home and visiting my family. Both mom and dad 
were always very good parents. In every way except for one, I knew I couldn't tell them that the dog man was real. And I knew I couldn't tell them that I'm not safe when I'm staying with them in their home where I grew up. It makes me sad to admit this, but it keeps me alive. My senior year in high school, I took to getting off my bus three stops early to walk a girl I'll call Anita home. I would then cut through the woods to get to my parents' home from her place. This is in Wisconsin, but I'd better not say exactly where. It's further out in the suburbs. Some people call it the country, but it's really just a part of the suburbs that bears sometimes wander in to visit. I have to say, that was another factor of my childhood. The bears. When I was very young, a bear wandering into town was something people would discuss for days. By the time I was 13 or 14, though, bear were in town three or four times each summer, and less frequently the rest of the year, when they most definitely were not hibernating, as I had always been told that they do. Each time one stopped by to graze on our garbage, people were less surprised. We'd had 15, 16, 17 years of bears wandering around without eating anyone's kids or pets, so people started to think of them as though they were sort of big squirrels or something. I'm deathly afraid of bears. Specifically, I fear black bears because that's what I'd seen wandering around town as though they owned it. I've heard that black bears are actually the smallest of all bears, other than maybe koalas or teddy bears, so I'm certain I'd be even more afraid of brown bears and grizzly bears and most especially polar bears, as I've read they can grow to be 12 feet tall or taller. That's the size of the dogman in those woods that lead up to the back of my parents' house, and I'm definitely scared of that thing. To be honest, I'd probably have gone to a college much closer to home if it were not for that big old dogman. I was bullied out of the state I was born in by that beast. Well, partially by the animal. And partially because I knew my parents would refuse to accept that this thing was actually real. At first, when I began walking Anita home from her stop on the school bus, I was so happy walking home through those woods that I was practically running the entire way. I suppose when I wasn't laughing and running, I was giggling and dancing. Anita was the first girl that I actually got up the nerve to talk to and then to get romantic with. It was a real first love. I was fascinated by anything she said or did. I would get amazed by the way she smiled or how she yawned or how she played with her hair. I worshipped her when she acted cool, and my heart even flipped when she did or said something nerdy. Anything she did, that was the most amazing thing any girl had ever done, as far as I was concerned. All her advice was golden. All her ideas were legitimate. My political views changed to hers. How could they not, when every word she uttered was so interesting to me? I had fallen hard for this girl. In return, she liked the way I would flatter her, but I don't think she felt anywhere near as serious about me as I felt about her. She didn't stop the barrage of compliments I uttered, but she sort of seemed to think she deserved that constant praise, and she wasn't overly impressed by it or by me. Still, we did hang out and neck and that sort of puppy love stuff, and to me, she was the most serious girlfriend I could imagine having. Outside of school, though, I don't think we went on more than two or three actual formal dates, which were all trips to see movies that sucked, but which she liked. All her favorite movies were incredibly bad. They didn't even have monsters. They didn't have superheroes. They usually didn't have any special effects at all. The only good thing about those movies she made me go to see was that nobody else on the planet wanted to see them either. So, the theaters were usually pretty empty. That meant we would sit in a corner and make out, which makes a bad movie far more tolerable. It's funny to me that I can't ever tell the story of that werewolf or dogman in those woods without first talking about Anita. She was the only reason I was there in that small forest in the first place. And she was the only thing on my mind through that entire period of my young life. So, 
Each time I went through that 10 minute walk in the woods to get home from Anita's place, something weird would happen, or I'd just get an increasingly weird feeling. I could swear I heard someone mirroring my steps. And I don't mean this happened one time. This happened regularly. So regularly that I started convincing myself that there was an echo in that part of the woods. There was also a bad smell in that part of my walk home too. The smell got worse each day, which made no sense to me. I mean, whatever it was, shouldn't I be getting used to that odor? Shouldn't it bother me less each time? And yet, it bothered me more. So one day I had a bad feeling while still on the bus that I normally don't get until I was walking home through the forest. It was very strange. I was literally feeling frightened of nothing on that bus. When we got off at Anita's stop, I felt like I was walking into serious danger. It was a paranoid kind of feeling that I'd never experienced before. Everything looked normal, so I was at a loss to explain what was going on. By the time I walked Anita onto her property, I could smell that terrible odor that I usually only smelled deep into my walk home. Anita could smell it also, which for some reason made me far more frightened. This had only been my little personal problem before, but now it was becoming hers as well. She didn't want to hang out because it was too smelly out there, so she went inside and I was left alone facing those woods and wondering what was in there waiting for me. This time each step I took under that tree cover was matched by another one that I could hear in the brush. It was not an echo, it was someone in those bushes. I felt like calling out and telling them that I knew they were in there and demand that they show themselves. But they had to be the origin of that terrible smell, so did I really want to know what they looked like? If they looked anything like they smelled, then no. I probably did not want to have a look at them. It didn't matter any longer, the situation was out of my control. Whatever that was, it had decided it was sick of stalking and waiting. It had already decided that today was the day when we would meet. I got nervous when I could no longer hear the sound of whatever that was stalking me in the bushes any longer. I could still smell the god-awful odor, but I could not hear where the whatever it was was. And then, when I reached a certain point on the path, it jumped out ahead of me. It was very early in my journey. Usually the sounds and odors hadn't even started yet. I was only about a minute or two into the walk. And yet, there it was. And I was finally seeing what had been paying so much attention to me. Well, up close... That offensive odor was so strong that it was impossible to ignore. It had been turned up to twelve. Imagine urine and onions being smeared on your face. It smelled so badly that my eyes were burning and tearing. My heart raced, thinking that I must be in the presence of a Bigfoot. Nothing was supposed to smell as bad as one of those Sasquatches. And as this huge humanoid form walked out of the woods to face me on the path ahead, I knew it had to be a Bigfoot. Except, it wasn't a Bigfoot at all. I mean, sure, it was tall and it was wide. Taller and wider than any man I'd ever seen. But when I saw the face on this creature, oh man, that was not what I was expecting to see. This guy was all teeth all yellowish, grotesque, blood-stained teeth, large enough to fit in the head of a velociraptor. But it wasn't a reptile or a dinosaur. It was a fur-covered monstrosity. It was a flea-ridden living horror. It had a long snout to contain those massive fangs, and it had big old dog ears way up on top. It wasn't a Bigfoot, and it wasn't a man. It was some kind of a canine that stood upright in the way I'd seen bears do when they were looking inside garbage dumpsters for food. In fact, this giant dog seemed more comfortable up on those two legs 
than I'd ever seen a bear behave. He wasn't focused on keeping his balance. He was walking confidently with his attention solely directed at me. He wanted to make it clear to me that I was not going any further on that path on that day. I thought about trying to run past him, but it didn't make it past the thinking stage. Even in my imagination, the creature easily grabbed me each time I tried to imagine evading him. His arms were too long. He was too strong looking. So here is what I was actually seeing. Imagine something built like Superman, but it's the size of a polar bear. I was very frightened in that moment, but I don't think I'm exaggerating at all. I think that hairy canine-like man thing was 11 or 12 feet from the bottoms of his doggy feet to the tips of his tall doggy ears. Yet his size did not slow him down in any way. He seemed wily and agile. There wasn't an ounce of body fat on this guy. His build was nothing like that of any kind of bear. This looked like a dog standing up, but muscled like a human bodybuilder. I just accidentally typed inhuman bodybuilder. Maybe that wasn't a mistake or a typo. Maybe that's exactly what it was. I looked up directly into the eyes of this thing wondering if I could appeal to him in any way. I wondered what he really wanted, and if he could be bargained with. Those eyes glowed a strange color that hurt to look at, so we did not meet eyes for long. They seemed more like light bulbs than eyes, but the rest of his face seething with a kind of anger and fury that I'd never witnessed anything like before was definitely real. This was definitely a living creature, even if those eyeballs look like they came from some kind of an evil robot. I'm not ashamed to say that I turned and I ran like a little B-word. You can call me any insulting name you would like, and I can't really say anything back to you because I completely, as the internet would say, cucked out. I wish I could tell you of my bravery facing the dogman, but it would be a complete lie. I was deathly afraid. And I turned tail, and I ran for my life. The creature roared in this way that sounded absolutely nothing like a dog or wolf or any sort of canine I'd ever heard. It was more like a bellow than a bark, like something I would expect a monster to sound like. I thought I was dead. The rest of running away only stays in my mind in brief images and feelings. I remember my legs not always working right, and I remember falling more than once. It wasn't very far to the clearing behind Anita's house, and I knew if I could make it there, the creature might let me go. I kept telling myself that he didn't want to kill me. He just wanted to chase me out of his woods. But I didn't really believe myself, and I was crying. I remember trying to call out to Anita, but... No sound came out of my throat, sort of like in sleep paralysis. By the way, when I've had sleep paralysis and saw the hat man in my room, I felt it was the fear that prevented me from screaming out to my family. In the same way, this dog man had literally scared me speechless. At least that's how I remember it, but as I've already mentioned, my memories of this event are very incomplete. I do remember hearing Anita calling to me as I lay face down in the dirt in her backyard. It took me some time to remember what had been happening. I was there in Anita's backyard and I was on the lawn and I was just waking up. Why was I there? What had happened? I was very scared but I couldn't remember why. Anita was walking over to me and looking concerned. I smelled something bad, but it was a different smell from all those other times. I realized the smell was coming from me, and I instinctively got up and ran away. I didn't want Anita to figure out that I had just soiled myself in fear. I took off jogging home along the highway in what was the most miserable afternoon I have ever lived through. Although I did tell a few friends about my sighting, 
and never admitted it to Anita. I think I told her there was a homeless man in the woods who chased me. I forget. I know I never admitted the truth to her because I was afraid she would think I was a weirdo and a nut job. Of course, I am a weirdo and a nut job, so I was always trying to hide that from the girl. She was my first puppy love, anyway. Maybe high school is too old for puppy love, but I was a late bloomer. So I have avoided those woods since that day, but the dogman was not done with me yet. I had a night not long after that, when I could not sleep. I decided to go outside and sit in the backyard, breathing in the night air. I was just restless and I didn't know why. So I got my bathrobe and I was putting it on when I glanced out of my bedroom window down to the yard outside below. Those same two glowing robot eyes were down there, already staring up at me before I looked. He seemed to be angry at my window or something, that huge dog-headed ape man. I could see his legs were canine rear legs, and yet they somehow supported his entire body, balanced perfectly, on top of them as though that's how dogs were designed to walk. It looked supernatural, but it did not look unnatural. It or he looked as though he were born to be a bipedal creature. I felt that same frightened stiffening of my limbs that I had felt in the woods when it became hard for me to walk. I was frozen in fear. I felt my courage and my private parts shrivel up to miniature size. I was completely immobilized with terror. Somehow that thing down there had woken me up. Somehow that beast had kept me from sleeping. And somehow it had made me think that I wanted to go outside. It even was able to make me think that it was my idea to want to go outside. Think about that. You're feeling an urge to do something, then you realize it was not your own urge at all. It did not originate from anywhere inside of you. It was an order placed into your head by... Well, by what exactly? I mean, what was that thing? The only thing I knew about it was that I didn't appreciate its interest in me. I got myself a white noise machine, and I would play it in my bedroom when I was sleeping. I would still wake up with ideas about going downstairs or opening the doors and windows for things to come into the house. Or I would have urges to go outside and lay down on the grass lawn. So, the white noise machine did not stop the dogman from broadcasting directly into my brain. When I woke up and heard that fuzzing sound playing so loudly in my room, however, that would remind me that the dog beast was trying to get me to place myself and my family in danger. That would be enough for me to turn over and try to get back to sleep. Maybe you can understand why I was in such a rush to leave for college. Even Anita couldn't keep me close to home when that dog man was continuing to bother me in such an intimidating fashion. So I'm summering with a friend on the East Coast this year and running out of excuses about why I'm avoiding visiting my parents and my hometown. Mom has put her foot down and says I at least have to come out for the last week before school starts again, or else she's not going to pay her part of my tuition. I couldn't afford to go then, so I'm feeling trapped. You know, maybe the dogman has moved on since then. Maybe he isn't even there any longer. And maybe even if he is, maybe he has someone else to mess with the mind of. Maybe it'll be perfectly safe for me to go back home. But somehow, I don't think so. And I'm worried that if I go back, I'll wind up. Ambushed. By the dog man. Some people are maybes or no's or a guess. Our EPCS though is always a yes. Please join us in thanking one of our most important executive producers, CS. Not only a channel member, CS also uses our handy dandy new thanks button to donate to us 
and help us stay on the air during yet another weird period on YouTube for some of us scary channels. Although you guys are battling hard to help us get our numbers back up, in spite of the algorithm fighting back at us with all its evil robot soul, we've been unable to bring revenue back up to where it needs to be for the channel to keep going. Even when we get better views, it's not fixing anything. I'm determined to defeat these attempts to destroy my years of hard work on this channel, but in the meantime, we really are only surviving because of people like CS. More from Henry Lee Dogman at the end of the show, but now... Dogman in Detroit Dear Scary Stories NYC I've heard you say on your show and seen you write in the comments that you like to tell stories of Dogman on your show because you live in the city, so this way you don't scare yourself with your own stories. That idea that dogmen never come into populated human areas is nonsense. Obviously, they are more likely to be encountered in or near wilderness areas. But rogue dogmen, who, by definition, have no tribe to return home to, may stray very far afield indeed. I would even go so far as to say that the wideness of the species distribution is largely due to the ability of rogue dogmen to travel great distances over the course of their lifetime. I am hardly an expert, but I learned enough while taking a few environmental science and wildlife management courses when I was back in college to know that this is how rogue males behave in most larger mammalian species. They travel alone, as most dogman sightings indicate, and they are on the lookout for females of their species as much as they're on the lookout for food. If dogman is not a mammal, then he is something close to it, like a marsupial, and I don't see why it wouldn't be safe to assume that 90% of dogman sightings and encounters are of a rogue male, far from his original tribe, if that tribe even still exists. I'm not saying there aren't reports of pairs of dogman or mothers with pups, but those are far less frequent than the stories about wild, angry, hostile, and dangerous young adult dogmen who act as though they have nothing to lose. Rogue males have already had everything taken away from them, and they truly do have absolutely nothing to lose in any way, shape, or form. This is why they have the reputation of being so much more dangerous, even than cougars or sasquatches. At least that's my current opinion about them. I'm willing to have my mind changed if and when further evidence comes in. I have to admit, I've always had a passing interest in cryptids, going way back to my youth, watching In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. It became something very intense only at the tail end of my time living in Detroit, which I moved out of just before Christmas of 2021. It's a long story, but I'll try to spare you most of the details that don't relate directly to the dogman. It was during the pandemic that some of my neighbors and I saw the dogman, or a dogman, no doubt a rogue as I've previously described, creeping about our neighborhood apparently hunting for both rodents and other smaller animals. There was plentiful game in that area if he dined on rats, that's for sure, and it seemed that was something the dogman found tasty. That figures into my first sighting of a dogman, in fact. I was throwing out garbage and intending on taking a jog early, just around dawn, when I heard the sound of dog nails on the sidewalk. I did not also hear the sound of dog tags, which in that neighborhood usually means a stray dog's there. I learned young to keep my distance from those. I've heard that sometimes they bite, but I've only experienced friendly ones. The thing is, an uncle of mine pet a friendly stray once and got some kind of a fever that almost killed him. I think the dog had ticks or fleas, and the fleas made my uncle so sick that he almost died. So I turned around fast when I thought I heard a stray heading toward me. As you can imagine. Well, I suppose it was a kind of stray, but this one was standing and walking up on his hind legs. He was kind of bopping down the street, enjoying the morning, not realizing I had seen him yet. In one of his hands, he held something that he was munching on, like it was a hamburger or a hot dog. When I saw a rat tail dangling from whatever it was, I no longer wanted to jog in that neighborhood on that morning. I've jogged through crime waves and it wasn't a big deal to me, but something about a wolf 
standing on its hind legs, being well over a foot taller than me at least, and eating a rat like it was an ice cream cone. Something about that is too much for me to handle, man. That's all there is to it. So I was trying to make myself move a few feet back to go back into my building where I would be safe, but I was sort of frozen, I guess, by fear. That was when the beast man looked up at me, and he became startled. He turned and ran around a corner into the space between these two buildings. And then I turned around, and I ran into my apartment building. We both scared the poo out of each other, and I counted myself as lucky to have gotten away with nothing worse than a brief scare. I had other sightings from further away after that. Those are just as scary or even scarier to me, but they don't translate as well into narratives. One time I had a dogman glare at me as I walked the long way to avoid getting close to it. That one appeared to have no fear of human beings at all. And yes, dogman was part of the reason I moved at the end of the last year, as the neighborhood seemed to be running out of large rodents, and I didn't want to find myself next on the dogman's breakfast menu. Of course, the main reason I moved was that I got promoted to a much better paying job, one that I could work at from home, and I moved out of Detroit to an undisclosed location, which I'm currently much happier at. I still have friends living in the dogman hood, though, so I'm nervous to even mention the area by name. Update. I've talked to a few of my friends from Detroit, and they said if I just leave out their names, I can tell their dogman sighting stories. They said they don't mind if I name the neighborhood, as long as I don't give out their home addresses. I just don't want the people living over there to think I'm dissing the neighborhood or anything, because I grew up there, and I always loved it there, and I'm sad that I had to move out. I hope that someday I can move back. I hope this is just a temporary thing. I don't mean any of this as a slight on any of the people living over there, because that was me only a half a year ago, and that's still me in my heart because that place will always be a part of me. Unfortunately, it's also now become a part of the Dogman. So there's that area on Bauman Street over there behind the church that can seem kind of desolate, especially at night. It's not a place to walk alone and unarmed, but that's what my friend I'll call Jay was doing one night when out from behind some bushes walked a Dogman. Jay said it wasn't like the Dogman was waiting for him, in fact, he seemed just as surprised to see him at first. But unlike the one I surprised on my block who ran away, this one got annoyed to find a human walking too close to his personal space. He immediately adopted a defensive position, bared his teeth, and growled. He lowered his head to Jay's eye level, which is probably the best way to communicate how much taller it was than my friend. Jay said that he didn't know that you weren't supposed to make eye contact with an angry animal, and he stared directly at the upright canine's eyes through most of this event. He backed away slowly, hoping he didn't trip over or bump into anything. According to the way he told it to me, the thing stared and growled at him until he had backed all the way back to the corner from where he made a break for it. I'm not sure which block he backed up to, but I'd guess it was either Larchwood or Penrose. Maybe it was Seven Mile Road, but it was right over there where it happened. Now, there are three sightings I heard about from people I know IRL that seem a bit different from the others. All three of those took place in cemeteries. All three of those, the witness wonders if they saw a dogman or if they saw a werewolf. There were two sightings that I've been told personally about that supposedly happened in Woodlawn Cemetery over on Woodward Avenue. That's just a few minutes to the northwest of that last sighting I was telling you about behind the Perfecting Church Cathedral. Google Maps says it's five minutes if you drive and 20 minutes if you walk, so I'm not kidding when I say it's close by. Woodlawn has some very rich people from Detroit's deeper past and some very famous and influential people from more recent times, like Aretha Franklin and Rosa Parks. It's got some ostentatious mausoleums, including one meant to conjure the majesty of ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome. Behind that particular museum is a lake 
shaped roughly like an hourglass, or possibly like an infinity sign depending on how you choose to see it. That was where my friend I'll call A told me he saw something that looked like a werewolf. It was the anniversary of his father's passing, so A was sitting by the water, thinking about both the good and bad times he had lived through with his dad. Unexpectedly, he heard a splashing sound, but he couldn't tell where it came from other than to his right. Getting up and wandering around toward where he had heard the splash, A said he eventually caught sight of what he took to be a very large dog doing the doggy paddle over to the farther shore away from where A was standing. He chuckled that it turned out to be a random pooch and plopped down on the lawn right there to return to thinking about his lost father. In a little while, A could hear the dog climbing up out of the water on the far side and shaking itself dry, gazing up to see if it looked as big out of the water as it had seemed while swimming. A said that if he wasn't already sitting down, this would have knocked him on his butt. The dog still seemed giant, all right, only now it seemed even bigger. A had looked over as the canine finished shaking the water off of him, and then reared back, pulling himself somehow up to a fully upright position, standing on his hind legs, as though they were his only legs. This sounds to me like the same exact creature all over again. It seems like the same thing I saw, or I mean the same kind of thing, same species. Since it was a 20 minute walk away, it could have even been the same exact one. So A's story ends with him seeing the dog man standing up because that was when he bolted. He told me I would have run too. He had never seen a dog standing like that one before. And to him, it was some kind of weird sign of the end times or something. He said that to him it was as surprising as if Bigfoot himself had climbed out of the water. He said he ran away and his only regret is not running sooner. I have another friend I'll call B who both lives and works in the vicinity of the two cemeteries along Woodward Avenue. She enjoys eating her lunch in the cemeteries and she used to also jog through them at night. She especially used to like jogging around the lake, sometimes crossing the little bridge over the middle part. She won't go near there after dark any longer though and it has nothing to do with the crime rate. It has to do with the smelly creature she almost ran into the arms of one night. Now, so far all the stories have involved the dog-headed men eating smaller mammals and either scaring humans away or running away from humans themselves. They've been as surprised to see the humans as the humans were to see them in most of the cases. Not so in my friend B's encounter. So... What she told me was that she was jogging along a path in the cemetery and she noticed a recent grave appeared to have been dug down into in a haphazard manner. The dirt was piled up in seemingly random places surrounding the grave. It didn't look like something done with a shovel. It looked really weird. Like someone had been digging at the grave with his hands or something. She said she almost slowed down to look but Realizing what she was seeing gave her a severe shiver and she decided to take a shorter run than she had originally planned and to cut around toward the nearest exit. The path she chose was, in her own words, really bad smelling. So much so that she felt nauseous and began gagging. The idea that she might be smelling something or someone that had been dug up from that grave was more nauseating than the smell itself and she was now running instead of jogging. And that was when two long, hairy, man-like arms shot out of the bushes along the side of the path, followed by a very tall and muscular naked man with a canine head. She felt it was more man than dog, but there was nothing human at all about its head. It was a fiery-eyed, wolf-like head, but one with far larger teeth than a dog would have in our world, this thing appeared to her to be a cross between a hairy proto-humanoid and some kind of particularly vicious proto-dog or wolf. 
It was savage even when compared to most other wild animals. It seemed to have all the worst aspects of humanity, including anger, intolerance, prejudice and pride placed in the brain of an animal that was born to kill and eat anything around it that it felt like. Seems like a bad combination if you ask me. So B screamed and ran and the thing ran after her making this sound that almost felt to her like laughter. She told me it was probably just the way the creature was breathing when it was hunting her but it sounded to her like the creature was enjoying her fear. It seemed to make him somewhat giddy. Then again, maybe she was misinterpreting the meaning of its behavior since who even knows what this creature was? I mean, she and I both sort of assume that this creature was the one who dug up that grave. But other than its bad smell, she doesn't have any proof of that. And there could be any number of reasons for the bad smell besides the grave desecration. It's possible the two had zero to do with each other. Some kind of night watchman came over or someone claiming to be such at least. He was scolding B for being loud. He reminded her that she was surrounded by souls who were at rest. That was when she realized that she was no longer being chased. B thinks it was a werewolf or else some sort of magical being. She doesn't think it ran away. She thinks it disappeared or maybe morphed into some other appearance. Right next to Woodlawn Cemetery is the much smaller Evergreen Cemetery. And that was the place where my friend I'm calling B had her second sighting. As I mentioned, B likes to walk through cemeteries on her lunch break, or at least she used to. This time she saw a dogman in the sunlight. Its fur appeared reddish at the ends in the day, so it seemed like a different animal than the one she had been frightened by at night in the cemetery to the immediate north. This time the sighting was from more of a distance, and she wasn't sure she would have even seen the creature at all had the same thing occurred after dark. The upright walking werewolf-like creature with the reddish-brownish coat of fur was seen darting between bushes toward the interior of the cemetery from where she was eating her lunch. She saw it three or four times, but very briefly each time, when she saw that it was carrying something in one of its hands. She decided to finish her lunch and head back to work before she found out what it was that the creature was carrying. Somehow she suspected it would be something that would make her lose her lunch in a literal fashion. So those are all the stories I've been able to collect so far. But if you live around there and you have more stories about this animal man, please leave a comment. And I might contact you if I think you're being serious. If enough of us are willing to stand up and be counted, we can maybe reclaim our streets from these creatures. Even though I know that, I'm still too afraid to attach my name to any of this. So how can I ask anyone else to? I'm trying to amass enough evidence and enough witnesses that maybe we can change all this or even put a stop to the problem. I am not in favor of exterminating this rare species no matter how dangerous to humans they might turn out to be. I would hope that they could be relocated though, away from human settlements and most especially away from cities. Because of all the problems and issues facing the people of Michigan these days, the last thing anybody should have to be talking about is <coughs> Dogman in Detroit. When you've got a name like Hairball, there's not much more to say. They've got the wherewithal to be executive producer today. Welcome our newest channel member, Hairball, who has gained access to our members-only community posts and can now find links there to our weekly secret uncensored videos. Nearly all of them are Dogman stories, but yesterday we uploaded an hour of episodes that got demonetized in 2017 for containing what YouTube labeled shocking content. You get to hear stories we aren't allowed to tell on this channel. You can join for one or two dollars a month, although there are more perks at higher levels. More from Henry Lee Dogman at the end of the show, but now. Will Dogman inherit the Earth? Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was extremely disturbed by your recent episode concerning Dogman creatures 
taking up habitation inside the once great city of Detroit. I am a Michigander as well, and I am sick to my stomach about what has been happening to our beloved state. There is nothing that we residents of Michigan cannot overcome when we stick together, but this dogman situation has reached a crisis because we can't even come to an agreement about whether the dogman even exists at all. I would like to tell you about my personal experiences and those of my close friends and relatives, and then I hope you will humor me and continue to listen as I propose a solution to some of these issues. Now, my family doesn't live in Detroit and hasn't for two generations, but that doesn't mean I don't care. We're mostly up further north around Shepherd, Michigan, but believe you me, we've had a dogman problem up here since long before it stretched down south to Detroit. The most recent sighting I've had was the most traumatic to me personally, because I was driving along Coleman Road to pick up my granddaughter from daycare when it happened. The idea of these creatures lurking around human settlements, and especially around our children, is terribly upsetting and quite alarming. Granted, I was still a few minutes of driving away from where my granddaughter's daycare was, but I hope you don't think it outrageous that this would concern me. One of my favorite things from when I was a child until now about this part of the world is how we are surrounded by trees and forest. It always used to feel good to be so close to nature, to be blanketed in it year-round. These days, with the legendary mountain monsters straying too far from their traditional homes and winding up in and around my neighbors, nature doesn't feel as much like a comforter keeping us warm as it does a plastic bag over our face, suffocating our entire way of life. So I was driving along a part of the road that has very tall grass growing up along the side. Almost looks like wheat or something. It's a few feet tall. I'm saying this because that's what I drove into when I swerved to avoid hitting the big, hairy, dog-headed muscle man who bounced out into the road in front of me that afternoon. This was the most ridiculously over-pumped steroid freak of all time with big dog ears and a long snaggletooth snout. It was like the Hulk turned into a werewolf on the full moon. It had to be over seven feet tall. I think it was much taller than that. I've never seen a man as tall as this thing, nor have I seen a man outside of a superhero movie that was this jacked. It didn't matter how much fur he was covering it with. You could see he was a massive moving wall of muscle. I sat in my stalled car, grateful that I hadn't driven headlong into a tree, staring at the beast man who had caused my accident. I felt like lecturing him about looking both ways before you cross, which is sort of a crazy thing to be thinking. I just got the scare of my life. I got run off the road by a literal monster. And here I was thinking superior thoughts. I glared at the monster as he gazed back at me, confused. I don't think it knew what to make of me until that moment I glared at it, which was me informing the beast that he and I were enemies. That is not a good thing to cause an animal to feel, as it turns out. The beast charged toward me with a similar gait to that which my mother used to use when she was walking over to give me a slap or a spanking. I instinctively knew I was in it deep, and I rolled up all the windows and double-checked that my doors were locked. The dogman fell upon my car, beating on it with the sides of his hand-like paws. I tried to focus on turning the key in the engine and restarting the car, but my hands were shaking so badly that it looked as though I had palsy. Seeing that I wouldn't look at him, the creature leaped on my hood and banged on the front windshield. I was whimpering and crying and failing over and over again to get that engine started. The Michigan Dogman was on my hood, trying desperately to get me to look at it. I knew if I did that, that I would be frozen like a deer in the headlights. So I kept my head down and my eyes averted, praying for the car to start up again 
so I could go get my grandkid and return to my normal life. At this point, that creature began jumping up and down on the hood, causing the car to rock as though we were on the high seas. I started to feel nauseous, and that made me angry. The anger, I think, helped me break out of my icy, constricting fear. And that was when I turned the key, and that engine, for whatever reason, actually started. I put the car in reverse and jerked it back as suddenly as I could, resulting in that dogman flipping butt upward, falling backward into the tall grasses. I pulled onto the road, put the car in gear, and then sped off, leaving my hairy adversary in the dirt. My granddaughter noticed I had been crying when I picked her up, but I told her they were tears of happiness because I was just so glad to see her again. That was in fact the truth, although only part of it. So I know of multiple sightings over by Chippewa and East River Roads and the woods around that area. The Chippewa River flows through the forest then continues along the northern edge of that golf course over there. I feel strongly that the dogman is among a number of animals that will stick fairly close to the Chippewa River to stay hydrated all day while hunting, or all night if they're truly nocturnal. I also feel that the creature is an opportunist, equally ready to work days or nights, depending on what luck he has been having in hunting, and how hungry he is that day. All of my sightings most of which were not nearly as exciting as the recent one I just described to you, were during the daytime hours, with only one occurring around sunset. Granted, I'm rarely outside at night any longer, but surely the animal cannot be purely nocturnal. Otherwise, logically, I'd have never seen it at all. So a friend of mine was camping on his relative's land right over there by the Chippewa River, Basically across the street from the golf course, you might say. He was doing this minimalist camping thing that seems to be catching on, where he didn't build a fire and he didn't pitch a tent, but he just slept in a sleeping bag in a tiny space between trees in the middle of the woods over there. I told him several times that I felt he was crazy to do things like that, and even crazier to do them alone. But this only seemed to encourage him to do it more. He enjoys shocking me. So imagine how truly shocked I was when he came back to tell me that I was probably right all along and he probably shouldn't have given me such a hard time about it. It turns out that he earned himself a face-to-face -face meeting with the dogman and this had him looking at the entire world in a new way. He really seemed shaken down to the core and his personality was drastically changed. He had become very humble. It only lasted about a month before his ego returned, but for a while there, this dude was shell-shocked. He had post-traumatic dogman disorder, for real. And here's the story he told me about why he was so shaken up. Okay, so he was sleeping under the trees in his sleeping bag, back to the ground, and belly up toward the stars. He was enjoying all his dreams, and snoring and whatnot when suddenly his face was being tickled. He was too sleepy to really even wonder if it was a dream or real or what the difference was between the two. He swatted at the front of his face like you would at a small flying insect, thinking that must be what was tickling him. Only his hand hit something large, making a slapping sound. This was quickly followed by a growling sound and the odor of extremely bad breath. So when he opened his eyes, he basically saw teeth, carnivore teeth, and he felt his face being tickled by dog whiskers. He had been being smelled by a very large dog as he slept. It tickled him awake as it sniffed away. This dog was huge, and he had him pinned. Having literally nothing he could do except lie there and hope for the best, my friend laid there and hoped for the best. 
The dog continued to growl while my friend tried not to cry. After that, the dog growled and it growled and it growled. And also, it drooled with the drool dripping onto my friend's face. That made it even harder to lay there unmoving. Although that certainly didn't stop him from doing just that. He had some strong motivation with dog teeth half the height of his head staring at him in the eyes. Finally satisfied that my friend was completely submissive to him, the dog leaned back and rose in the air, higher, higher, until he was impossibly high, making my friend wonder if he was dreaming all of this. He was seeing a seven or eight foot tall dog man, or a dog headed man. The creature was bipedal, and my friend had to look a long way up to still see his head. Clearly bored with my friend, the dogman walked off to find more important things to do. My friend told me that creature carried himself like he was a boss. He acted like this was his forest, so you had to play by his rules. One of the guys I used to work for a few jobs back once got tipsy at an office Christmas party and told me about seeing the dogman at his country club while he was playing golf. He said there was one patch of trees on the course where a very large dog would sometimes run out from and grab your golf ball, then run back into the trees. This creature was so large that none of the golfers wanted to go into those woods to retrieve their ball. They would just use another ball, placing it at a spot both agreed that the previous ball had been before being taken by the oversized canine. One day, a guy who had lost more than one ball to that dog already decided that enough was enough. He said, it's only a dog, and he charged over to that small grove of trees, intending to march in there and get everyone's balls back. Well, as he reached the edge of the wood line, out walked that big dog. Only he walked out like a man on his hind legs. He walked up to this dude, looked down at him from his great height, with his expression on his face like, What do you want? And that tiny little six foot tall man turned around and walked away just as fast as he had walked up, maybe more so. In other words, that wasn't just a dog. It was a dog that was oversized and capable of walking around upright on its hind legs. Sound familiar? A cousin of mine who said I could use her first name Elizabeth actually moved to Milwaukee to get away from one particular dogman who followed her home from camping one time. Sort of like a ghost attachment, you might say. She and her husband would see it lurking around their property at night, and it led to quarreling within their family. Elizabeth said her husband reacted like he was jealous of the dogman, which made no sense to her at that time or now. Instead of being supportive as she was getting stalked by a predatorial cryptid, he seemed convinced that she had given the dogman some reason to be so interested in her. Their marriage was on the rocks, and so Elizabeth went to stay with her mother, who is my aunt. Well, once she got there, the house started getting pelted with rocks at night, or at least that's what it sure sounded like. Nobody ever saw it happen, but... You couldn't help but hear the banging. When you'd look outside, well, yes, there would be rocks on the ground, but how could anyone tell if any of those had been thrown up on the roof? For all they knew, the rocks were falling out of heaven. They literally couldn't tell. That didn't stop anyone from wondering if the dogman had followed Elizabeth to her mother's home. They all visualized the dogman, or possibly several of them, hurling rocks at their roof. Elizabeth said the only way to make it stop was for her to go outside and look around. She was convinced the thing wanted her to come outside so it could look at her some more. If she walked around for a good minute before going back, then the banging would stop for at least the rest of that night, and sometimes for a couple or three days. Since nobody had actually seen the creature at the new location, there was not a true sense of alarm about these strange happenings. One morning when Elizabeth rose at dawn 
To start driving to a business meeting she had at a somewhat great distance later that day, she was so surprised she almost fell over backward by a dogman who had been hiding behind her car. The way it happened was that Elizabeth was looking through her bag trying to find her fob to unlock her vehicle. She wasn't really watching where she was going because she thought she was the only person there in that location. When she clicked the fob and the car made its little noise to tell her that it was unlocked, a huge, as in eight or nine foot tall, hairy man-like canine bounced up from where it had been squatting and hiding behind her rear bumper. How it had made that immense form small enough to fit behind her rear fender unseen, she could not explain to me, but that was what she said happened. Fortunately for her, the creature was spooked and it ran away into bushes that lead toward the neighborhood park. If it had jumped toward her to attack, Elizabeth admitted to me that she would not have known what to do and she would have been unable to defend herself. Realizing this, she no longer felt safe at her mother's place, and she resolved to relocate to a city. As I said before, she now lives in Milwaukee, where she says everything's been fine so far. She has always assumed that the city was too populated for the dogman to ever put in an appearance. This is why we both reacted with sadness and alarm to your recent episode about the dogman invading the city of Detroit. No offense to whomever gave you that one, but I sure hope it is not true. I don't want to think that it's gotten that bad over there, because then things might get really bad up here. Possibly it's becoming time to get serious about this and develop a more effective strategy for dealing with all aspects of the phenomenon. I think we can probably all agree that nothing meaningful can get done concerning this issue until it has been proven without any remaining doubt that the dogman is in fact a real species. Since they are disinclined to want to be identified, there must be a concerted effort made by both government and educational institutions to track the creature down and identify its DNA. Until this can be achieved, the various problems attached to dogman infestation will continue to multiply and fester. Now, what we would do about the Dogman once we knew for a fact it was provably real, I can't predict. I don't think it's very fruitful to even concern ourselves with that part of it until the animal is proven to exist. Now, I know there are plenty of people who feel the Dogman is both real and not real, or that it can pop into and out of our reality. I am not arguing with those people as they may turn out to be correct in the long run. Obviously, if something like this explains the situation, then we aren't going to be able to solve these problems through government intervention. I suppose if Dogman turns out to be something extra-dimensional or intra-dimensional, then we'd probably be better off praying for help than asking the government. But if we presume Dogman to be real in a conventional way, and if we see the current global trends concerning actions being taken which have already cut deeply into the human population of Earth, then we see an obvious trend. As our population drops quickly and drastically, so too is theirs growing. It sounds laughable right now to discuss Dogman becoming more populous than humans, but to mock me means missing the main point. The Dogman are predators. They don't need to outnumber you to wipe you out. There are always fewer predators to more grazers in the world. But those few predators need a very, very large herd to feed on. We humans only hold the top position on the food chain for two reasons. Our technology and our huge numbers. Those who think they are wise are trying to engineer a huge drop in human population while assuming that our technology will keep us on top of the food chain. But what if that is an invalid assumption? What if we can only stay the rulers of this world if we continue to grow our population? What if depopulation means the discontinuance 
of our survival. I can tell you one thing for sure. There are other species who are noticing that we are displaying weakness. They are noticing holes in our defenses and they are increasingly penetrating our borders and living off of our excesses. They're ready to take over, in my opinion. Because if we aren't a lot more careful, Dogman will inherit the earth. Some peeps are erudite and clarcy, while others are difficult to parsey. Then there are those who are just a farcy, but none compare to Deborah Darcy. Please join us in thanking Deborah of RC Deborah Darcy for rejoining our channel memberships. She gets to see all our weekly secret uncensored stories and we get to stay on the air a little while longer. More from Henry Lee Dogman at the end of the show, but now... Wood Booger Summer Dear Scary Stories NYC, I was born in 1949, and to most people of my generation, the summer of 1967 was the summer of love. The Beatles put out the greatest of all psychedelic albums, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the finest music and culture of the 20th century seemed to be blooming and growing all around us rather than being created or built or manufactured. It was the most fertile period in human history since the Italian Renaissance, and utopian dreams of a brighter future for all of humankind seemed inevitable. It would all crash down starting the next year, as both Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy would be brutally taken from us, and addictive, dangerous opiates replaced psychedelics as the choice of the most respected and beloved artists. Nevertheless, it was a brief moment of happiness for the kids I grew up with as we became young adults, and we hoped our generation would make the world a better place. I personally experienced none of this, though, as I spent the hot months of that year banished to live with my uncle in the country as punishment for having dated someone that my mother didn't approve of. I experienced no partying, no bliss, no insights, no multicolored reveries, and no free love. Instead, I did chores. I worked hard. I sweated so much that my eyes burned nonstop. I hunted for my food and I saw some of the strange, monstrous, semi-human creatures my uncle had always told us shared those woods with him. That's why, to this day, I think of the middle of 1967 as the Wood Booger Summer. My uncle's house was in the woods near the Yo-Yo Ganey River, at this point where there was a little mountain right on the other side of the river that Sugarloaf Road runs along the top of. He had no electricity, no plumbing, no refrigerator. We had a rainwater well, we had an outhouse, we had lanterns with flames inside them. There was an official hunting land near us, but we hunted everywhere anyway. We dried our meat in the shack as there was no other way to preserve it. We had a big hole that Uncle dug into a nearby hill that served as our root cellar. We'd can berries we picked in glass jars and stick them in there to keep them somewhat cooler. There was work to do all the time, from sweeping the floor to cleaning up the disgusting outhouse, but we managed to have fun anyway. Uncle had three times the stress of my parents, but unlike them, he didn't take it all so seriously. At night after we'd eat, he'd play the fiddle and show me how to play some bits too. It was as sweaty and hellish as my parents hoped it would be by banishing me there, but it was actually less depressing than living with them and their shifting moods. My kids and grandkids owe a debt of thanks to my uncle in that he taught me more about raising kids in a strict but sane atmosphere than I ever learned from either of my narcissistic and uptight modern parents. Also, It's because of him that I got to have my only cryptid experiences of my entire life. The first creature I ran into was the Ohio Grassman. At least in my mind, that's what I think it was. Where we were situated was in Pennsylvania, 
about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, about 20 miles north of the border between Maryland and West Virginia, and about 70 miles east of Ohio. We were centrally located between areas that I now know are monster hotspots. We were like nowhere for humans, but we were at a crossroads for all sorts of animals and cryptids. The thing that I saw, which I think was the Ohio Grassman, was like a Bigfoot, but it had so much hair on its head that I literally couldn't see its face. I only read about the Ohio Grassman in the 70s, but before I had heard of him, I used to compare this monster to the green gargantua from the Japanese monster movie, War of the Gargantuas. He looked like he was covered in moss or something. His long hair or fur was brown, but it had a green tinge to it. Where the sun would hit it, that would reflect back green somehow. I don't think it was a walking plant or anything, but the hair had a greenish accent. Sometimes people ask me if it might have just been a guy in a ghillie suit, but I've seen those before and they don't look like this guy looked. Here's what happened the way I remember it. I had just spent a couple of hours cleaning up an outhouse disaster and then I walked to the Yo. That's what my uncle called the Yo-Yo Ganey River. I washed myself. I washed my clothes. I got the stink off of everything and I was starting to feel human again. It was beginning to get dark as I walked back through the woods to Uncle's house. About halfway there, I walked into a wall of stink. I thought it was me. I was really upset that I hadn't cleaned myself up properly. I turned around to walk back to the yo and wash myself off again. When what did I see walking toward me on the path but this big, and I mean big, monster man. I ducked behind a tree and a bush and squatted down to hide before he saw me. This guy was hairy all over with brown hair, but like I said before, there was a green tint on top of the brown somehow, and the ends of the hair as it hung down were more green than the tops. It was almost as though his roots were growing in and he needed to go back to the beauty parlor and get a new green hair dye. He had long hair hanging in front of his face so I couldn't be 100% sure it was a Sasquatch, but it sure had big feet. The ground shook each time it stepped down. I was nervous of being discovered, but almost as nervous about the fact that he was walking in the direction of Uncle's house. I stayed hidden even after he had passed me, trying to decide when it might be safe to come out. When I noticed that the terrible odor was dissipating, I realized he couldn't possibly be that close any longer. Tentatively and carefully, I began to get up and walk towards Uncle's place down the path. I kept looking behind me and all around me, and I went really slowly, ready to jump back into hiding if anything should happen. When I got to within sight of the house and I still didn't smell anything bad, I made a run for it, and I got myself inside. Uncle laughed at me and asked me what was wrong. I told him the story and he said, Oh, so that's what that stench was that passed here a few minutes ago. So the grass man had walked near the cabin after all, just like I thought he would do. After a while, Uncle started snickering to himself and I asked him what was so funny. He said I was lucky I cleaned the stink off me before the grass man showed up. Otherwise, he might have mistaken me for his girlfriend. That was Uncle's sense of humor and we both had a big laugh in relief. I had a big scare, but nobody was hurt, so it felt good to laugh about it. I saw three other kinds of things that I would call a monster that summer in those woods. I'd tell you about the hopping dog man, but that story is really violent, so I don't know if you want to hear it. I saw another kind of thing that must have been a dog man as well that I called German Shepherd Man back then. I'll tell you about him in a minute. But I may as well go in order, and he was the last creature I saw before I left those woods for good. Chronologically, the next strange thing that happened that summer was the coming of Bald Squatch. I called him that because he had a receding hairline and a really tall forehead. I think he was a Bigfoot, but his face was not ape-like. It was very human, although in a primitive way. Like, his body seemed to be covered in fur, but his head definitely had hair on it and the beginning of male pattern baldness. His hair was short in the front but came down to his shoulders in the back 
So you could sort of call him Mullet Squatch as well. I hadn't heard that word back then though, mullet. I think that didn't start getting used until at least the 70s, maybe the 80s. I knew a guy in the later 70s with that kind of haircut because of his office job, but we called it a short long, not a mullet. So anyway, this Bigfoot had reddish blonde hair on his head and his chin, looking something like a beard. It was kind of like the orangutan characters in the old Planet of the Apes movies, but he was bigger and superhuman. His body fur was a darker shade, more of a reddish-brown color. He was so wide and muscular that his proportions were those of a short man, yet he was the tallest skyscraper of a man or animal I've ever seen. I was terrified at the sight of him, but he did not behave aggressively toward me. Here's what happened. I was walking around with a basket looking for ripe fruit to harvest when I heard a low sound like someone saying, Hoot. I don't mean I heard a hoot. I mean I heard someone say, Hoot. I turned and looked, and about 30 feet away from me, there was this giant bald squatch with blonde hair, and he was looking right back at me. I quickly averted my eyes from his and looked down at his feet, his massive feet. Each of those would stretch from my crotch to my chin once he started stomping on me, so I wanted to prevent that from happening. I could feel his eyes on me, and I tried to act as though I weren't absolutely petrified. I wanted to pee so badly, but I just held still and tried to breathe deeply and fully, like Uncle told me to do if I ran into a wood booger. This was the woodiest and boogeriest of all the wood boogers, so I was breathing very deep, and I was looking downward. After what felt like 97 years, I heard the mullet man rustling some leaves. I didn't feel like he was watching me anymore, so I glanced up quickly to see what was happening. Damned if he wasn't there in those woods for the same reason as me. He was reaching up way high in this mulberry tree, and he was pulling down berries. Then he was tossing him in his giant monster mouth. I wanted to turn and run, but I figured I'd better not make any sudden moves. Backing away. One step at a time, it seemed that the big blonde monster man was not all that interested in me any longer. I wanted to keep watching him as I backed away, but I decided it would look more normal and less weird if I just turned and walked slowly and quietly away in a more casual manner. Like I was bored of him, too. Instead of watching him, I would continue to listen to him. I figured he was probably very fast when he needed to be, but at that size, I would be certain to hear it if he ran up behind me. I decided that if that happened, I would run off path through the woods toward Uncle's house. In retrospect, that would have probably been a terrible decision. That creature man must certainly have been more skilled at running through a heavily forested area than I was. Anyway... It didn't run after me. When I turned to walk away, I heard Bald Squatch say, Hoot, again, more softly this time. Maybe it means aloha, or maybe he was just glad I was leaving and not trying to steal his mulberries. Next, I'll tell you about German Shepherd Man, who was not as laid back as Bald Squatch, believe me. Uncle and I had come back from a successful hunt, and I was outside skinning and preparing the meat while he was inside sleeping to regain his strength. I began to smell something foul in the air and I rushed my work, thinking that the odor meant the meat I was preparing was spoiling ahead of time. In retrospect, I would have preferred if that were the case. Soon enough, there was a growling sound, an unmistakable angry dog sound. I instinctively got up and took a few steps toward the house to get myself a means of defense, if you know what I mean. Before I took a third step, though, the dog making that noise tore out of the underbrush behind me and spun around, winding up on the ground in front of me, between me and the house. It was a German shepherd, but the largest one I had ever seen. It was down so low on the ground that it literally might have maxed out at one foot above the dirt, but I could already tell it was the largest dog of any kind I'd ever seen. This German Shepherd was bigger than a Golden Retriever. It was as big as an adult brown bear, I would say. 
It crouched only two or three feet in front of me, ready to pounce up toward my face. This dog could easily take down someone much bigger and stronger than I was, which meant I was trapped. There wasn't any way I was going to get past it and into the safety of the house, and if I turned around and tried to run for it, this thing would surely catch up with me in seconds and bring me down from behind. It felt like the only choices left in my entire life were whether I wanted to get taken down from behind or from the front. I chose a third option and I backed up slowly. The dog growled and got that worried look that I hate when dogs get. They become unpredictable when they have that expression on their face. For instance, this one, as I kept backing away very slowly, decided to stand up to its full height. On all fours, his head had to have been four and a half feet off the ground. His legs were incredibly long. Then, the dog made another decision. Now it would stand up to its other full height. Rearing up on its hind legs, the beast now stood well over six feet tall, possibly seven for all I knew. I wasn't looking up there. I didn't want to accidentally meet its eyes and get that thing even angrier. The German shepherd man took a step toward me, a bipedal step toward me, and I found myself shaking violently as though there was an earthquake going on, but it was only affecting me. Sweat tickled me as it ran off my arms, my neck, my face. It was like I was a waterbed that someone had pricked pinholes in all over, and now I was leaking. I could hardly think anymore. I could just basically palpitate and sweat. Soon, I realized my eyes were leaking water, too. This was going to be so painful being eaten alive by a giant bipedal German shepherd. I felt self-pity beyond even what a teenager normally feels, and I felt anger, no, fury for my mother who had consigned me to this early grave for daring to date a girl she didn't like. I swore to myself I'd come back and I'd haunt my mother. I'd punish her for her cruelty and selfishness. It gave me a sense of control over the circumstances I found myself thrust into when actually there was nothing I could do anymore except wait for the inevitable to happen. And then the great beast took another step, but this time not toward me. This time he stepped toward the deer meat I had been cutting up and beginning to process I stood perfectly still and watched him walk over on his hind legs in much the same way you or I walk. And then I saw him drop to all fours in one violent motion and begin to dig its snout deep into the innards of what was once a majestic buck. With the dog's back toward me, I calculated the idea of running past him and into the house. It seemed worth taking the chance, so I took a tentative step in that direction. German shepherd man shifted around to get at something it wanted to eat, and now its body was facing toward the front door. I no longer thought my chances would be that good if I tried to make a run for it, so I looked behind me for another place to attempt to escape to, as much as I didn't want to accept it. The outhouse was back there. I might be safe in there, at least safer than where I was. Slowly, one silent step backward at a time, I inched away from the hungry monster man. When I had gotten about 20 feet away, I walked at a more normal pace for the last 10 or 15 feet and entered the smelly wooden restroom, closing the door behind me. I looked out through the peephole and continued watching the German shepherd man eat what would have been a month of meat for us in just a few minutes. I was beginning to get drowsy because being completely afraid and shivering all over for an extended period of time can be exhausting. When the loud explosion came unexpectedly from Uncle's rifle, I nearly fell over backward into the mess in that restroom, if you follow my meaning. I heard Uncle calling my name, and I looked outside. German Shepherd Man was gone, and my uncle was standing there with smoke still coming out of the end of his weapon. I recognized this as my chance, and I ran toward the house. Uncle's face got a big smile on it, and he was so happy to see me. Then I watched as his smile melted away and a look of horror replaced it. Faster, boy, faster, he shouted, lifting his weapon 
and pointing in my direction, only up over my head. I knew what that meant, and I didn't even look behind to confirm my suspicion. My running had attracted German shepherd man back. His instincts told him to chase me, that I was game. Nevertheless, I had no option in my mind except to run harder, which is what I did. Then Uncle suggested another option. Get down, he shouted, and I belly flopped onto the dirt. Another loud explosion echoed through the area, and I heard birds fly away, squawking. Get up, shouted Uncle, and I ran the rest of the way into his house. When we were both safely inside and the door was locked behind us, I started mocking Uncle. Get down, get up, I said. You're like a drill sergeant. We both laughed, and he gave me a big hug. We had survived. We had escaped the jaws of the giant dogman. Soon I wondered aloud what we were going to do with that deer carcass that we left outside. Uncle suggested maybe he could stand guard while I looked to see if any of it was salvageable. We agreed to the plan, opened the door, and saw the dogman dragging the deer away into the woods. He was down on all fours, gripping it with his teeth and pulling it backward across the forest floor. I suppose we could have battled him over it, but there was something terrifyingly unnatural about that beast, and so both Uncle and I decided to let him take our food. At least he hadn't taken our lives. I mentioned before that I also saw this kind of jumping dogman. I can tell you that story too, but it's more violent than the other encounters I've told you about already. Just let me know if you want that one. My other friends had their wild stories about the summer of 1967, but all I can tell you about the warm months of that year are cryptid experiences that I had in The Wood Booger Summer Here to explain how you can help us survive and what cool stuff you get in return is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank? Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary stories.